there are some phrases that are used in the Gospels, such as Father and Son of God, or Sons of God, that are taken literally by Christians. That honestly, it requires an entire video of its own. God the Father signifies the creator of all human beings. God is the Father of all of us. God is Jesus' Father, my Father and your Father as well. John chapter 20 verse 17 And go tell my brethren that I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Anyone who claims to have a God cannot be God. It is claimed by Christians that the use of the Hebrew word for Father, Abba, by Jesus for God, signifies a special relationship of a physical type. This, however, is unwarranted since every Christian is supposed to use the same word, Abba, for God. Look it up in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, and Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Sometimes certain other terms used by Jesus for himself are presented to prove that he was claiming divinity. Terms like the Messiah, the Savior, are not only applied to Jesus in the Gospels, but have been applied to others in the Bible. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, yet in their case no one says that they prove divinity. If their claims were to be presented truthfully, then we would have not one, but many candidates for divinity. An example, Cyrus the Persian, who was a pagan, is called the Messiah in the Bible. Look it up, it's in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1. It is, however, covered up by the translators who translate the word as anointed. The Hebrew and the Arabic word Messiah comes from the root masaha, which means to rub, massage, or anoint. Ancient kings and priests were anointed or anointed into office. It doesn't mean that the person so named and termed is God at all. The title of Savior or Saviors is also used for other people in the Bible. Look it up. 2 Kings chapter 13 verse 5 and Obadiah chapter 21 and Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 27. Translators are well aware of this, so they substituted the word Savior for deliverer to throw off readers. Jesus has a servant master relationship with God. Luke chapter 2 verse 52. Jesus never claimed to be equal to God or of the same nature as God. Attributing divinity to Jesus Christ, son of man, son of Adam, goes completely against his teachings as found in the New Testament. The other term, son of God and sons of God, are both used in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. Metaphorically speaking, God is the cherisher and sustainer, and hence the father of everyone of us, from Adam to the last person. This doesn't mean that the person so described as a son of God is physically begotten by God, or of the same nature as God. Otherwise, the term son of God would not make any sense. God, by definition, signifies one who received his existence from nobody. Whereas, son signifies someone who received his existence from somebody else. God and son are mutually exclusive terms. They can't go together. The use of the term by Jesus and in other places in the Bible is purely metaphoric and not literal. Chapter, Luke chapter 3 verse 38. Adam, which was the son of God. Genesis chapter 6, verse 2 and 4. That the sons of God saw the daughters of man, and when the sons of God came in and to the daughters of man. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. 
Israel is my son and even my firstborn. Romans chapter 8 verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are called sons of God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. It should be clear that the term son of God signifies only a righteous person. It doesn't mean that the person so titled is divine or we would have hundreds of gods according to the Bible. While Jesus is described as the Son of Man 83 times in the New Testament, whereas he's described only 13 times as the Son of God, what we also see is that Jesus used the term your father, thy father, describing God's relationship with people 13 times before he first ever said my father about God. All this show that he was in no way implying that God physically begot him. Muslims do not use such terms. They refrain from using these phrases for they don't want to fall in the same pit where the Christians found themselves. Yes, God is like a father to us in the sense that he cares for us. Father is a term of endearment, especially as it was popularized about Jesus. It has been said that Jesus spoke to God as a father, and Christians have taken this as a simple way of referring to God. From the Quranic point of view, monotheism Tawheed is extremely important. If people call God Father, they may fall into a sort of confused thinking that the Father is literally the Father of Jesus, not biologically, of course, but in a real sense. And if Jesus is the Son of God, in a real sense, then he must be like God, and maybe he deserved to be worshipped as well. To avoid this sort of confusion, the Qur'an draws a clear line and presents God as the only Lord, the only God. While there is no simple directive that says that a Muslim cannot call God Father, the Qur'an castigates those who say, we are the children of God. The Qur'an poses the question and asks, why would God punish you if you are really his children? One might say, that this is about those people, not about the faithful believers. Nonetheless, Muslims developed this understanding that they don't refer to God as Father. Muslims refer to God as Lord and Creator. Muslims don't say Ab or Abba in Arabic for Father, but they say Rabb, Ilah, Eli, Ilahi, Allah, the Sustainer, the Cherisher. If the Muslims start thinking of God as Father, then perhaps this is presuming too much for ourselves, as though we are children of God and we have a right over Him. Having said that, historically speaking, guided by Greek philosophical commitments, Christianity moved away from the original and clear teachings about this subject within a few hundred years after the time of the apostles still guided by a desire for historical and cultural conformity many today want to say that jesus is somehow actually a part of the one god himself in one way or another yet this cannot be true since the bible clearly teaches that jesus was a man and is not the one god whom the bible clearly indicates was the father Referencing back to the Messiah role, it seems historically speaking that once it was determined that Jesus the Messiah was not enough, the Christian religion filled that role with his mother Mary, created the sonship role and added more water to the flower by inventing the Trinity. As that wasn't enough and still continuing to feel the need for the mediator role to be in place. The Trinitarians has, have blinded 
meaning with their biblical doctrines. And hardly can their followers read a verse in the Bible without referring to the doctrine. There are plenty of statements in the Bible which conflict with the false doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus was not God. He was who he said he was, God's prophet. The scriptures repeatedly make a distinction between God and Christ as two separate individuals. Now, being in the line with what just previously said about the criteria for being God, Jesus himself admits that the Father is the only true God and sense that he does not know all future events. If someone claims that Jesus is God, he would only be what? A false God or an idol of the people. And this is what the Muslims are saying. So we looked at the criteria of God and Jesus obviously does not fit that. Let's look at another criteria for prophethood and see if Jesus fits this one. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, um, this time verse 20 and 22. What does it say? Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 20 and 22. It says, But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. It's in Deuteronomy. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptu presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Now, let's, let's dissect this, this, um, these verses. The criteria for prophethood is if the prophet speaks a word which does not come to pass, then it's obviously not from God. And it's from the prophet's own mouth. And he's a false prophet. You see, now we want to know if Jesus had any prophecy that did not come to pass. Let's take a look in the Bible and let's go back now to the canonical Gospels to Matthew chapter 24 verse 3 it says now as he sat on the mount of olives the disciples came to him privately saying tell us when will these things be and what what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age or the end of of the world the disciples here want to know what are the signs of the end of the world. Jesus in the following verses goes on to describing what the signs of the hour are. But he recaps it off in verse 34 to 36 saying, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So again, we see Jesus repeating that he does not know the hour. And guess what? In verse 34, it says, Verily say I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. You see, so the writer of Matthew is putting these things or these words in Jesus' mouth that according to him, Jesus is saying that the end of the world was going to take place before the generation would pass away. And in other places, in the Gospels, it mentioned, it's mentioned that some people standing before him would not see the end of the world. 
Some people standing before him would not see the end of the world, that the end of the world would come and take place before those people would taste death. Now, obviously, as Muslims, I want to caution you. We don't believe that Jesus spoke these words. We believe that he was a true prophet of God. However, I'm just calling your attention to the questions to see that according to their own Bible, Jesus was a false prophet and does not fit the criteria of true prophethood. So not only does he not fit the criteria of being divine or God, he also doesn't fit the criteria of being a prophet according to the Bible. We believe that Jesus was not God, but he was a prophet of God, a messenger sent by God to the children of Israel. And this is the, and this to correct the uh, misunderstanding that Christians have about Jesus and about God and invite you to Islam, the religion of all the prophets, including Jesus salam. May the peace and blessings be upon him. I am aware that some Christians try to get away from this false prophecy by reinterpreting the passages that I quoted to mean something about the destruction of the temple so that all these things were fulfilled, that it was about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Now, the problem with that is, if you look in the Bible to the cross-references of Matthew chapter uh, 24, what is going to tell you? It is going to tell you that this is referencing to Daniel chapter 7. Read Daniel chapter 7 and see what it's telling you. Daniel chapter 7 is about the end of the world. It is not about simply the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. It is about the end of the world. Jesus said this, and this is what the prophecy in the Old Testament is speaking about the Son of Man coming on, on the clouds of heaven. This is the end of the world. Now, other people want to point to a verse in uh, Philippians that discusses Jesus becoming a servant and emptying himself. So they try to get out of the problem of Jesus not knowing the hour by saying that he simply emptied himself. Well, the problem with that is, well, if Jesus was God before and emptied himself of this knowledge of the hour, well, then the Son could not be God on earth because he didn't have this knowledge which Isaiah says is a necessary component of what God is. Having this knowledge, so maybe even if we wanted to give it to you, that he was God before, well, now he wasn't God on earth. And if he got that knowledge back, well, who gave it to him? The Father, right? Well, this is some kind of subordination theology in which even if you want to say that Jesus is God, well, he is subordinate to the Father. But we already went over that. We already showed that Jesus himself said only the Father was God. Now, the whole emptying himself doesn't work, doesn't get you out of the problem. And this brings us to another topic, the inconsistencies in the Bible and the contradictions, which I'm sure Christians um, deny that there are any contradictions or inconsistencies. However, um, Christian scholars admit that there are over 5,000 uh, contradictions in the Bible. Let's take a look at a healing event that is described in Mark chapter 1 verse 32 to 34. Mark chapter 1 verse 32 to 34. It says, At evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. In the English language, all is not the same as many. Jesus healed many, not all. 
all were brought, pay attention, all were brought, and he only healed many. All were brought, and he healed many. Now, let's take a look at a parallel of this passage in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, you have to keep in mind that biblical scholars recognize that Mark was the earliest of the Gospels written and that Matthew used Mark as a source. So when comparing similar stories in Matthew and Mark, you see that in Matthew actually edited some of the stories found in Mark. And this is one such example. If you go to Mark, I mean Matthew chapter 8 verse 16, it says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. You follow me? Now it's switched around. In Mark's gospel, it says they brought all and he healed many, right? But in Matthew's gospel, it says that they brought many and he healed all. In Matthew's gospel, he's seeking to clear up the problem. What is the problem? It gives off the impression that Jesus could not heal all that he, uh, he could not heal all, that he only healed many. He didn't heal all of them. So Matthew clears up that up by saying, wait, no, what was brought to him was many and he healed all. So they switched it around from many to all. The obvious problem is that the words are being switched. So which one was it? Was it what Mark originally said? All brought to him and he only healed many? Or as Matthew's gospel says, that many were brought to him and he healed all. So which one is? Because they're not the same. You see, you must choose one or the other. And here lies a contradiction. And like I said, biblical scholars admit that there are over 5,000 contradictions in the Bible. I hope one day um, I'll make a video of those contradictions. Yet again, another conflict between Mark and Matthew. So Mark chapter 1 verse 11, where Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist. It says, Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We know that John the Baptist was baptizing for the remission of sins. The Christians want to tell us that Jesus was sinless. So what was he being baptized for? In verse 11 it says, and there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is a voice coming from heaven. What I want to know is, were other people who were standing around watching John the Baptist, baptizing Jesus, and including John himself, did they hear the voice from heaven? Did they hear the voice from heaven, or did only Jesus hear the voice? Well, this verse gives off the impression that only Jesus heard the voice. It is saying, you being directed at Jesus himself, that you are my son and whom I am pleased with. Now, keep in mind that Mark did not have this notion of a virgin birth, so Jesus is being declared or adopted the son he isn't son from eternity. He's being adopted as a son. And the you is addressing Jesus. So it gives off the impression that only Jesus heard this voice from heaven. God saying this from heaven to Jesus, according to Christians. Now, what we find in the parallel story in Matthew's Gospel. If you go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 17. It says, And lo... A voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am pleased, and I am well, well pleased. In Mark, it says, You are my beloved Son. In Matthew, it says, This is my beloved Son. Matthew again switched it 
around because he wants to clear up what he thinks is a mistake with Mark. From you only being directed at Jesus to this, so this is given the impression that God is presenting Jesus to all the people that this is my son. So now it appears that they can all see all the people gathered around Jesus, including John the Baptist himself, can hear that this is Jesus, my son, and whom I am pleased with. Because Matthew had the idea of the virgin birth, Jesus did not need to be adopted as the son of God. You see, so that's why he's clearing this up by presenting it, presenting it, Jesus to the people as the son. This is my son. So Jesus can hear it and also can the other people. So now the contradiction comes, who heard the voice? Did only Jesus hear the voice as Mark says, or did everyone who was there heard the voice in Matthew's gospel? We know that the central doctrine in Christianity is the atonement of Jesus Christ, that he supposedly died for all of our sins, right? What does Jesus say about this? Does Jesus say that he died for all of you, all of your sins? Or does he say that good works are necessary for salvation? Well, let's take a look in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 5. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 20. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to verse 20. It says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever, therefore, breaks one of the least of the commandments and teaches men to do so, Paul shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So, entering heaven according to Jesus in this passage is conditional. What is conditional upon you if you keep this laws this laws that aren't found in the old testament jesus says not one jot or one tittle it should pass away so salvation is conditional up in you following the law jesus did not come to get rid of the law like paul says and that you only enter in god's presence as if you accept jesus as your savior that he died for your sin this is not what Jesus is saying. If we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16, it says, The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. But every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Look, there is no substitutionary atonement according to Deuteronomy. Every man dies according to his own sin. Now, one might ask, what did Jesus die for? If he was sinless, as the Christian tell us, he was sinless. Then, what was he put to death for? Because according to Deuteronomy, God only puts you to death for what the sin that you committed. No one bears the burden of another, as the Qur'an says. This is what the Bible is affirming, that every man has to be put to death for his own sin. And this rules out the idea of substitutionary atonement by Jesus or anyone else. God does not subscribe to that. To conclude, the Gospel of Mark is very controversial 
and lacks consistency. It is written with a very immature style and full of contradictions. Mark provides re relatively very few details to the events surrounding Jesus. This relates to the Gospel's authorship, which is believed to be based on the memories of the uh, uh, Apostle Peter. Matter of fact, the entire New Testament is based on recollection of memories. That is far from being the Word of God. I don't think my brothers and sisters in Christianity understand what it means to say the Word of God. The Word of God is not a recollection of memories of men. And by now you realize I did not leave Islam for Christianity as the title indicates. Of course not. But do you know why? Not because I was born a Muslim, which is by far the biggest blessing of all, but because I studied in depth not only Islam, but also Christianity and Judaism with critical and historical approaches and from an academic perspective. I'm not afraid to study the Bible. And like most of Christians, they're afraid to study the Quran. I live by Islam every day, and I wouldn't die but a Muslim. The only way of life accepted by the Creator, the Almighty, the way of all the prophets and the messengers, include, including Jesus, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him. In Islam, we have faith, and we have proof to back it up. We don't just believe blindly. Islam is the same message taught by all the prophets, from Adam all the way to Muhammad. I am lucky that I was born Muslim. Obviously, the, the Almighty chose me out of millions to be a Muslim, and I am thankful for that because I very much know the struggles non-Muslims go through. Just ask those who reverted back to Islam. They'll tell you the darkness and the ignorance they lived before Islam. It's a big deal being a Muslim. It's about your own salvation. It means to live in accordance with the will and the pleasure of the Almighty. To live the straight path leading to paradise, the eternal life. In other words, the principles of Islam are simple and straightforward, free of ambiguities, confusions, inconsistencies, contradictions, and mysteries, and that comprehending them on and living in accordance with them is not difficult. The Quran says, Say, O people of the Scripture, people of the book come to an agreement between us and you that we shall worship none but Allah and that we shall ascribe no partner unto him and that none of us shall take others uh, for lords beside Allah and if they turn away then say I bear witness that we are the who have surrounded unto him as a Muslim, I am commanded here to invite all people of the book, all learned people, all people who claim to be the recipients of divine revelation, of a holy scripture. Let us gather together into a common platform that we worship none but God, because none but God is worthy of worship, because he is our Lord and cherisher, our sustainer, worthy of all praise, prayer, and devotion. The creed of Islam is given to us here in a nutshell. The Quran says, Say ye, we believe in Allah, and the revelation given to us, and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and that given to Moses and Jesus, and that given to all prophets from their Lord. We make no difference between one and another of them and we bow to Allah in Islam 
chapter 2, verse 136. The Muslim position is very clear. The Muslim does not claim to have a religion peculiar to himself. Islam is not a sect or an ethnic religion. In its view, the message is one because the truth is one and God is one. It was the same religion preached by all the earlier prophets. In the Quran, chapter 42, verse 135, it was the truth taught by all the inspired books. In essence, it amounts to a consciousness of the will and plan of, of God and joyful submission to that will and plan. If anyone wants a religion other than that, he is false to his own nature as he is false to God's will and plan. Such a one cannot expect guidance, for he has deliberately renounced guidance. Be like the scribe in the Gospel of Mark chapter 12, verse 28 and 34, who told Jesus, You are right, teacher, in saying that God is one and there is no other God but him. This is the Muslim position. God is one, and all the prophets and messengers are his servants including Jesus. May the peace and blessings of God be upon him. See, there is no complication or confusion in this. It's simple and it's clear. It's called submission. So submit to God, the one and only true God, and be a Muslim like Jesus. Till next time, Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you.